Hi, good morning everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm shooting this video after almost a break of a week or so, I guess. Uh, I wasn't well a bit. Uh, my son got cold. You know, he's a developing child, 2.5. And he transferred me. Plus, I don't know, some kind of viral infection was going on in the air. And being in contact with kids daily, being a pediatric dentist, I think I also got a bit of uh, malaise, you know. Like, constantly the body's aching and you just don't feel like doing anything. But anyways, I'm fine now. Also, the last one week, my son was at home because there was a gap between his summer camp and the school term, which has just started from today. So when he's at home, it's nearly impossible to do anything around him. <laughs> he just wants your constant attention, you know. That's how toddlers are. And uh, I know it's this age where he's asking for attention. Once he grows up a bit more, he wouldn't even care. So I, I wanted to be with him as well. So anyways... Um, Let's solve another one of our Australian dental questions today. And today's question reminded me of an incident. Like a few years ago, I remember, I had this patient uh, who, a very, uh, you know, polished female walks in with her four-year-old daughter, some Eastern European country extra. And she comes in and she's like, my daughter's having a pain. And I already have the x-ray done from another dentist. So I'm like, great. Oh, let me have a look. I had a look, a grossly carious primary molar. I think it was 5-4. And carious straight in the pulp, uh, classical signs of irre irreversible pulpitis. She had the x-ray, very visible on it. The carious going in the pulp. The roots are nice. So I told her that if you already have the x-ray and you know the symptoms, the tooth, uh, either you can extract the tooth uh, because it's a milk one and give a space maintainer or the second option is you can save it, which I would recommend uh, because uh, she is just four and the tooth is supposed to fall around the age of 10 by doing a pulpectomy treatment. So she goes on like this. Uh, I know you are a doctor, I know you have studied dentistry, but I have done my own research and it says that root canal should not be done in kids. And I don't want to extract the tooth, so how about you just fill it? I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't do that, uh, it's a wrong treatment. Yeah, yeah, but I have done my research and with all due respect, you may have done your studies, but my research, I feel I'm very confident about it if you just do a filling. She'll be all right. I mean, you cannot convince such patients to change their mindset if they have already made up their mind and they're not even willing to listen, you know. And they feel they are the most superior, most being and uh, whatever you know is either nonsense or not of good use to them, basically. So I politely said, I'm sorry, I cannot do the filling and I understand you have done your research, but we also have some evidence-based researches. Then she goes on to like, okay, so in that scenario, then you extract the tooth because I know for sure root canal will create many problems. Like I said, I've done my research. I was like, okay. And in my mind, I was like, I've done thousands of root canals, you know, but it's no point arguing, so might as well, you know, just make the patient sign the consent and relieve the pain of the child. Because extraction is a legit treatment and there is no point convincing the patient that root canal would be better for the child. So anyways, I went ahead and extracted the tooth. But look at the attitude, you know. So uh, you will for sure encounter such patients and then you should know how to deal with them. Best is to not interfere much and let just guide them to the possible ways of treatment which are ethical and even though you may have the best interest of them in your heart, if they only don't have the best interest for themselves in their heart, what can you do about it, right? So yeah, let's move on to this question. A female patient visited your clinic complaining of a badly broken tooth one sex, first permanent molar. She is in pain, but she does not believe in dentistry. Great. She only wants to follow a holistic approach. Previously, she has been receiving treatment from a naturopath. So probably the naturopath could not treat her tooth and that's why she's with you. There is a difference between pulp sens sensibility test and a test of pulp vitality. The latter means 
great this this is a very nice question you know because uh, many people just get confused uh, though it's very clearly mentioned in all our basic textbooks the problem is uh, as a third year bds student as a fourth year as an intern still mostly the colleges that ask you to check the vitality of the pulp is by doing the pulp sensibility test so you think that is the only test and if you get a response to that test that means that is it i mean you don't have to do anything else because they don't have the equipments uh, because they, those equipments either are very delicate and the college doesn't trust you to handle them well or they are very expensive which will actually give you the status of the blood supply of the pulp See, vitality means what? Uh, blood supply has to be there. It's it's like you, you know, tooth is a mini version of you. Like if I stop the blood supply, you'll be dead. But if the blood supply is continuing and your brain is dead, you're still considered as alive because the blood supply still circulation is going on, right? Similarly for the tooth, uh, when when the question is saying. You have to test the vitality of the pulp. It's basically asking you to check if the blood supply is there. Because if the blood supply is there, then things are fine. But if the blood supply is gone, then the nerve is also going to die. Because from where the nerve is going to receive the oxygen to thrive. The blood is supplying the nerve. And the nerve is giving you the uh, results of the testing. You understand? So everything is dependent on the blood supply and the blood supply is not measured by the cold test that we do. That is a thermal test. That is a test of the nerve. But uh, endo eyes is the only thing that we do or max will go to that hot gutta pacha stick or put a little bit of hot instrument on the tooth to check the temperatures. And uh, of course, we also ask the patient, right, uh, what triggers cold, hot food stuff. Nobody has the means to check the blood vitality as in the, the, the those pulse oximetry tests, the laser Doppler flowmetry test, etc. I think I've made a nice video on the pulp uh, vitality testing, you know. Watch that, please. So anyways, uh, what is the difference between pulp senses, sensibility test and test of pulp vitality? The latter means what? Basically, pulp vitality means what? It's a measure of a blood flow. Test for a continuous sensory nerve pathway from pulp to the brain. No, that's a sensibility test, not vitality. Measure extent of caries activity. No, all of the above. No, the answer is measure pulp blood flow. If you have not watched my previous video, pause this video. Go to that video, search on YouTube, Dr. Garima, pulp vitality. You may find that. Even if you're not able to find, search for any video which says the latest methods to test the blood supply of pulp and you will get some videos on it go through that because you have not done those tests you are not able to imagine and actually grasp the concept of what vitality means and it's not your fault it's just that you have never been exposed to that and you were just exposed to the endo eyes because that was easily available that was cheap easy to conduct blah 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 so all those things so no issues uh, you could not learn at that time you can learn now right make use of this time so that is what it means now you have to give her fluoride as part of management now, how will you convince her for the treatment she is constantly emphasizing that she believes in a holistic form of treatment and what does holistic mean it means basically just do magic right <laughs> no it means do minimum stuff like don't touch my tooth and still treat it no the tooth is something that cannot be treated that way but uh, how will you convince her see first thing is that i always believe as a clinician you should present facts you should never try convincing a patient because the moment you try to convince a patient, it's like you're selling some treatment. The patient will get a vibe as if you're trying to sell something. Like, as a clinician, I'm telling you, I never ever convince my patients. I always tell them, you know, in the first appointment, these are your options. These are the pros and cons. Think overnight. You don't have to do anything right away. And then once the patient sleeps over it, uh, understands the pros and cons of everything, then the patient only gets back to you. Because they know you're not trying to, like... Make an urgency out of the situation and sell something for my benefit, you know. 
the patient needs to understand that uh, uh, they came to you for a consultation and they that they have all the options you know i i give them like literally all the options available uh, even though they'll be like no no we would like to save the tooth uh, and i'm like no but you still need to know your options so they are like yes uh, you know uh so no matter what you should just give the options and uh, in a very scientific evidence backed manner and leave it at that if you do that see your practice will grow very immensely because you're doing the right thing so uh, yeah options are show her evidence based research on fluoride rights that's the answer you will not care about changing her belief kind of true like i don't care about changing her belief uh, but i do want her to understand that there are things outside of what she believes and she should take a consideration of that also you will give her a pamphlet about that uh it's not a wrong thing but pamphlet is something a little informal like a non scientific way if you gave actually an evidence based research like an article or a meta analysis of something that would be great because pamphlet is also considered as a form of advertisement right it's like you're just advertising or trying again to sell a product treat her anyway as you are looking to do the best for her yeah just because i'm 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 trying i have best interest in her doesn't mean i do what i want right she has to consent for it and you're not a dictator like just because i feel i should do this it's best in your interest let's go ahead and do this we are not those american tv series where we keep on saying it's for your safety it's for your security i wanted the best for you <laughs> you know you have, you have seen a lot of netflix series right you'll understand when i'm trying to say all those crime series they they make choices for the best of people oh my god like let the people decide for themselves <laughs> so you find that there are other incipient carious lesions in the mouth uh, what will be the management toothpaste uh, 1200 ppm fluoridated water fluoride varnish fluoride tablets see for incipient carious lesions now incipient is a keyword here uh, for any incipient carious lesion a varnish is always the best answer tablets are not allowed uh, fluoridated water is not going to alter anything topically you are just ingesting it system systemically and that is beneficial until the child is growing till the age of 8 but incipient carious lesions the water is not going to help toothpaste is not a bad answer but it's just 1200 ppm now varnish on the other hand is 22600 uh ppm that's the 5% sodium fluoride varnish uh, or even if you go with apf it's 19000 something ppm or the stannous fluoride again high concentrations of fluoride and fluoride is known to assist it's known to expedite the process of remineralization so if i have to give fluoride for an incipient lesion i will obviously choose a very high concentrated fluoride and so varnish becomes my right answer of choice how frequently should a professional uh, topical fluoride application with stannous fluoride or acidulated phosphate fluoride be administered for optimal results it's always 6 months always i mean this is basic thing you should know this it's always 6 months it's straightforward answer straightforward question i love such questions you don't have to break your head you solve it in like 5 10 seconds you move on unlike the other questions which we have solved you know where we keep on thinking what is the keyword what should we choose they all the options seems right this is like the best question this 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 provided in the guidelines move ahead but what were the other options uh, 3 months 12 months or uh, 18 months na nah, 6 6 months uh but i'll tell you another protocol that we as a pediatric dentist are also following off late in a child if they come for uh, and you can also follow that this is just an extra piece of information that i'm giving suppose a 2.5 year old child comes with a lot of incipient carious lesions and you know he's not going to sit let you do work and uh, etc so then in that scenario you can apply fluoride once every month for 3 months and then give a break of 6 months and then evaluate that is also accepted protocol and very young children if you feel you know you can try and help reverse back it faster rather than it progress into caries because the child is still small small 
but that is uh, in very different scenarios. For this patient, stick to six months. Now, in recommending a toothpaste for a patient, consideration should be given to the amount of stains present on the patient's teeth, the need to whiten the teeth, the need for caries prevention, the patient's plug situation. The patient's plug situation, uh, you'll have to educate them about brushing them. But if I were to recommend a toothpaste, uh, I would be focusing on the need for caries prevention. And that's why we have fluoride toothpaste with different concentrations of 1,000, 1,450, and 5,000, right? So in a bit of high caries lesion, I might recommend 5,000 ppm and low 1,000, 1,200, 1,450, you know? Stains and white in the need are not my thing. Uh, stains can be removed by scaling. Stains are not caries. Excess of fluoride or less fluoride is not going to alter the stain status. So the answer should be the need for caries prevention. So I hope this is clear. Uh, yesterday only somebody was asking me, uh, do I need to memorize the fluoride chart from, uh, chart from therapeutic guidelines? And I was like, yes. <laughs> fluoride chart has to be memorized as difficult, as complicated, as confusing it may sound. Write it down daily. You know, when I was in 11th standard, I, I had chemistry as I mean, all of us, I think, science students would be having that. And there were so many formulas like this plus this is that and alcohol is formed by this and benzene is formed by that. And you have to draw those rings and remember how many oxygens and hydrogens were there. Boy, I could not remember anything. So what I started doing was daily in the morning, as soon as I used to get up, first of all, I had made a chart and I placed it on the dashboard and then daily morning the moment I used to get up even before I went on to brush my teeth I used to just sit and write you know slowly over a period of time I got that muscle memory like even if I wasn't uh, like fully awake uh, still my hand were writing the right formula because I was practicing it so many times and and by the time my exams came it, it was on my fingertips like in my in my sleep I could just write and give it to you uh, so, uh, when things are confusing and when you're, um, you feel, okay, I cannot memorize this, just start writing daily and it works. It works well. This is my experience. And then you will not be finding it difficult. Th that's the same thing I did uh, for my dental materials, uh, subject in, uh, first year of dentistry. I wouldn't remember the concentration of all the materials. Like alginate has this, 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 and that much concentration. No, I should write it daily. So, uh, yeah, I hope that helps and uh, have a nice day and uh, special thank you going out for Dr. Shubhra. Uh, she messaged me on Instagram the uh, day before yesterday that where are my videos and I was like, I'm, I'm shooting one. I'm coming back. Thank you for missing me. <laughs> missing the videos, basically, not me. Uh, so, yeah, here I am. This video is for you. I hope you enjoy and I hope I shoot another one tomorrow. Since now that my son has actually started going back to his proper term, has started of three months, the first term one, and I've enrolled him for four days a week instead of five, Wednesday being the off day, uh, because I cannot stay so away from him, you know, all five days. When I put him in summer camp for five days, I think at the end of the eighth week, I only started missing my time with him. Because what happens is uh, he goes by 8.30, he comes back by 1.30, he has his lunch, he sleeps. And then I leave for my clinic at 3 and I'm back by 7. So the only time I have with him is from like 7 to 9. And I was like, this is less. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So I was like, I'll keep Wednesday off for him. And Wednesday would be the mummy baby day. And I'll take him out of public transport. I, I want him to see and learn all those things. And I take him out to somewhere, you know, do basically mother-child bonding activities. So, uh, expect my videos on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Fridays, Wednesday, question mark. <laughs> so, I hope you have a nice day and exam is coming up. How are you feeling? Write in your comments. I love your messages on Instagram. Send messages. Bye-bye.